Welcome to the UX Coach Podcast. I'm Andy Parker, and this week I'm talking to Anna Kingchesh, Head of User Research for Y Partners, a Hungarian design agency. I wanted to learn more about how Anna found herself as Head of Research for an agency straight out of university and how her background in cognitive sciences and landscape architecture influences her processes. We debate the merits of focus groups, how to handle difficult or aggressive research participants, when to do interviews or surveys, and how you can improve your interview technique by studying mindfulness and self-introspection. Here's Anna to get us going. So hi, thank you very much for having me and inviting me on your podcast. Uh, I'm Anna Kincesh. It's a very hard uh, name. It's Hungarian because I'm Hungarian and I do live in Budapest, Hungary. And I work here as well. Uh, I never really worked ever outside of my country. Um, so I only have my local experiences. And um, so far, I've been working as a UX researcher or design researcher, as I call it nowadays, uh, for the past three years. And it has always been the same company, which is a very, very small um, design studio, we call it, because it's only six people um, who are regularly working together. And then we have partners or contractors who we work with um, if, you know, a project just grows too big and we can't take it. But I'm the only researcher in the team and also the only woman in the company. And I've always been. We had one uh, intern for eight months, nine months, I think. But it was a little different setting, you know. That's it, I think. <laughs> Tell me uh, a little bit about your your current role then. So you're, you said you would now kind of describe yourself more as a design researcher. Yeah. So what does, what does that entail for you? Do you work on internal projects or is it client-based? Oh, it's absolutely client-based. Uh, I just made this made up this new name i was not really um satisfied i think with this phrase ux researcher in the past half year maybe or one year even because my role uh changed a lot so i would say in the first well maybe one or one and a half years it was only research but really like i didn't really have as much responsibility as you know um, contacting the clients and being really in such a constant and tight contact with them and also the other parts of the process so my role was just doing the research and then handing over my insights and kind of this is it. And so in the past um, one and a half years so in the second half of my career so far uh it changed a lot and in quite a short period so it was i think just a few months it shifted towards being much much more involved in the uh, processes after the research even so i had this problem that i would just say you know that i'm not only a researcher but i'm also a design strategist because i'm not yet a ux designer and I am not even close to UI design because I don't draw. So, and it's my choice. It's not like I can't or I don't want to. It's just, oh yeah, it's, it, I don't want to, to be honest. Uh, I'm not that interested in that part of the process. In the UI design. Part yes, of yes, the yes. Yes, exactly. But even wireframes, I'm not wireframing. If I, I can if it's uh, on paper, you know, <laughs> because I enjoy the discussion. So this is the, there is a very subtle part of our processes where I finish the research, I have the insights, and then we sit together, just us or also with the clients. It's It depends on what the client is like, if he or she needs it or not. But so we sit together, the team, and uh, we draw this strategy, you know, based on the insights. And then maybe we even start sketching in the next few phases. And I'm also involved in that one, although I'm not using, you know, softwares 
to actually uh, design or draw prototypes, wireframes, etc. So it sounds like you have found yourself in a in a really great position in in many respects that you have got a very narrow focus to your to your role because you've you've been able to sort of carve out you are the only person that does this in your organization you're the only researcher but what challenges does that then have being the only person that's doing it? Oh well <laughs> <laughs> The first uh, thing that came to my mind was that, you know, if we have a lot of projects because this is life and sometimes it happens that just more projects come in at the same time, then it's extreme, then it could be extremely overwhelming. But I'm lucky enough to say that my coworkers kind of help me. So it's never like I do research alone because this is another drawback, I would say, of being... Uh, a solo researcher that um, I prefer having other people by my side, even when I'm uh, moderating interview sessions, for example, because I like if, you know, there is another person having a different perspective on the topic we discuss. And maybe if I forget something that was not written on our script, but might be interesting to ask, and I don't think of it because I'm so, you know, uh, involved in just going through the script and paying attention to my interviewee, then maybe this other person would ask it. So I, I really like it if there, there are other people and also also in the processing or the analyzing phase of the data, I kind of do it alone, but then I bring it to my UX designers right away so they can have a look at it and maybe they would have, you know, a different interpretation of the findings that I'm showing them. Uh, Also, I thought of it a lot when I started in this job. When I landed in this job, you know, I was was not only the only researcher, but it meant that um, they trusted me enough to say that although we know know that you've never done this job before, but you kind of have some kind of um, preliminary knowledge of how this goes, we trust you to establish this whole research methodology in our company, which is great. But, you know, at the same time, I didn't really have any kind of mentor or like a senior to lead me on my way, but I kind of had to find my own way, which was, you know, full of arguments and compromises uh, and stuff like that. So where do you go then to, to find that support? You, you know, you're, you're thrust into this responsibility of, yeah. we don't really know how this goes, but we think that you can figure it out for us. There's no one else here to help you. Where, where have you found support to be able to develop that uh, practice in those processes? Yeah, so first of all, the only experience I had was that in the last uh, year of the university, we had the opportunity to apply to some classes at uh, an external institution, which happened to be like a technological institution, and they had a course uh, of UX design, basically. But it was not even really UX design, but it was more research heavy, for which I was extremely happy because by then I already uh, figured out that this is what I want to uh, get myself into. So I made this course, but that was it. that was it all. And then, so everything was so accidental, and I was so lucky, I think, because I applied to some positions to a UX researcher, like a junior, you know, I, I, would, I didn't think that I could, uh, I don't know, just jump into it and do it alone myself. Uh, but they didn't really, I didn't get positive responses. And then um, I just told one of my professors, he has like, so Anna, uh, you're going to graduate soon. So what was going to happen after? Uh, because I did cognitive science. And so, you know, people do research after university if if they really want to continue with cognitive science because it's a very research heavy field but I told him like well I don't really want to do research at the university so I was uh, thinking I would try this UX research but I'm not sure because I don't really 
know where to go with this. And it just turned out that he had a friend who had a company doing UX design and UI design, and they're looking for a UX researcher. So this is how I landed in this job. <laughs> Originally, you <laughs> asked uh, where I turned to gain more knowledge. Well, my friends always laugh at me because I, I'm a 100% Google person. And I'm trying to explain everyone how Google is like the biggest invention of humanity because it's basically, I mean, you can access it, you know, even from your phone, which is always in your pockets. So you have the whole, the knowledge of the whole world in your pockets and you can find everything on the internet. So I've just read and read and read and read a lot of articles and a lot of even academic research papers and everything I, I just could. And it was kind of um, um, unfolding through, you know, doing it because I had a general idea of what we have to do. And each time I actually came to applying uh, a method, I just Googled it and read like five articles about it to make sure that I'm doing it right. Tell me more about your studies and mm -hmm the overlaps that you've seen with that so you, you studied cognitive science yes where where have you found that there's overlaps in this sort of field of digital design and the things that you were looking at within those studies I recently talked to someone who pointed this question out to me like Anna I just found out that you are actually not only a cognitive scientist but you also have a degree in landscape architecture. How come? What is the combination? And so I explained to him, like I explained everyone else and like explained all of my professors and my peers and everyone that I know it's weird. I can't, I can't help, but I've always, you know, altered between these two interests of mine, which is either some kind of verbal expression of myself or visual expression in more like an artsy way. So first, the visual win, and I had this interest that I want to be a landscape architect, a landscape designer, because it's such a beautiful field, and I can design, and it's beautiful, and my name is going to be on the little tables, like a little signs on the park, etc. Well, this is not how reality goes. <laughs> <laughs> So by the time I finished school, uh, I realized I don't actually want to be a landscape designer. But that then came my other interest, which is which has always been psychology and just human cognition in general. So I had the chance to apply to a, to a master's program in cognitive science. I didn't, yeah, I didn't finish school yet. It was a lot before the last year of uh, this master's program, and uh, I remember I had two different, you know, part-time jobs and I was so desperate to find out how I'm going to continue because I already knew that probably I don't want to stay at the university and do research there. Um, I, I Probably I want to work somewhere in business. And so I opened up Google and I literally just typed in my two main interests, which was design and psychology. And, you know, UX, UX design and UX research articles just came up and I was like, oh, damn, this is, exact, this is exactly what I want to do. Have you found that there are other, there's other skills or activities that you have learned through both doing both of those courses that you are still using today? Because any form of architecture, landscape architecture, that's all about learning how to develop spaces that are used right it's the interaction exactly. with the space exactly so what are the things that you bring that's that's different because you have that background mm, exactly you're absolutely right this is exactly what I thought when I started to work in this that actually landscape architecture is is closer to this field than we would think um for the exact reason that you just mentioned, that we were developing uh, in environments, outer spaces for people in urban areas, and we we did have to do research 
for that. So we uh, we did, you know, um, best practice analysis, for example. You always have to go through all the exi- existing solutions and you also collect the inspiration for the, de- for the design and everything. So it's very similar in many ways. And we also had to do all kinds of... Um, analysis of the area that we want to design so it was very interesting and also there were some overlaps um which were even more closer like sometimes we did like an environmental analysis of the area of an urban area uh about how people use it so we tracked if there is let's say a huge open space near some uh, road or something then we analyze and there are maybe houses around or something then we analyze how people use this area like do they w- just walk through it just cross it to reach the closest bus stop or do they use the actual you know pavements that are there and we just find found you know that people do go for the easiest and shortest uh, solutions which is the most comfortable for them so there were a lot of overlaps the concept of desire paths which is is a very popular topic in yeah. UX design right <laughs> it, which stems from that entire urban design I still take pictures of things now and actually my my partner does the same thing has become completely obsessed of every time you start to notice where you've got that mudslide through a field and you yeah go, ah that's because that's actually where people want to walk. So you, you've you been able to bring that into the way in which you explore the problem space that you're being asked to for the for the products and services that you're on. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us a little bit about what the, what the market's like, uh, where you are then. I confess that I don't know much about it. I think I've definitely worked with some development companies that like specialise in back-end technologies outside of that it's it's a it's a market that i'm not really familiar with is a lot of your work for local businesses or is it across europe or international organizations um yes so far we've only worked with local companies but in but within that it's smes to multinational companies but just the hungarian part of these uh, companies so always local companies but within different uh, within like a very wide range of the size of the organization right uh, which I really like because they are they are totally different and we also work with startups which I know fall into the SME category but it's again a, a totally different story well, the, about the market in general, I'm not sure if um, I'm not sure what to say because I know that I have an opinion, but I'm not sure how biased my opinion is. I have the feeling my uh, because I really don't know how that is in other countries, but here I definitely feel that we had to establish a very consistent and willful just character as a company that we insist on doing research because people don't really like research i read i i've read um (laughs) articles from other countries so i assume it's it's not only like that in hungary but i definitely experienced that it's something that you really have to you know say why why is it so good? Why do we need this? Why does it cost so much? It's not even that much, but it's just research. We can also do it. Yeah, so it's the hard sell, isn't it? If, if... Absolutely. You know, and my favorite part is when they say, when you bring the insights, it's like, oh, we already knew that. Well, of course, we didn't do it in the first place because we we were not sure that you know it or not, we bring it in the first place because we want to know it from like the users or stakeholders or whoever we are interviewing or uh, serving. We want to hear it from them. And also we want to, through that, we want to validate your assumptions. It's not like, you know, we are inventing something totally new, but we have to validate it. We can't, we can't, 
build systems on, you know, just assumptions of someone who is absolutely biased in his or her assumptions because it's his or her own project. So it's very, it, it, I think it needs um, education probably. And you think that this is a, a wider sort of challenge across across the country, sort of just within the design industry as a whole? Uh, I think yes. I think yes. Um, but I'm not sure, honestly, I'm not sure about uh, other companies. I see that they uh, do have researchers everywhere. I think it's just a big fight that you have to have with your clients. So I'm not sure. This is why I say that maybe I'm biased because after all, for example, us, we managed after all, and we do have research in all of our projects, I think. And for me, it's three years, you know, and I think in the past two years, we always had research. So it's not like people don't buy it at the end, but it definitely needed education. Like they needed to understand that this is part of our process and we are not building or designing anything without this solid base of knowledge. So what other challenges do you do you find yourself with uh, for the next year uh, in, in your current role? Well, right now, I definitely feel at a point where I have to like grow to be more and more responsible. And we talked about me and another one of my colleagues um, getting more responsibility and, uh, you know, even owning projects and managing projects uh, by ourselves. And this is exactly what I, I feel I'm at right now. Like, I feel that I do have kind of the competence, but this is just another shift in perspective that I have to practice and get used to. What does leadership mean to you that or being a leader what what makes it different to the position that you found yourself in three years ago of uh, effectively being thrusted quite quickly into a, a role of responsibility yeah for me leadership will look something like well you you have to take responsibility not only for a whole project but you know a whole project which invol- involves people on the client side as well as on your side. And you have to manage these people. And I, I kind of feel that I'm, uh, I'm already quite good, good with uh, clients because I always had to when we had the, re- the, um, uh, yeah, the research phase, then I was the one you know, who had to contact them all the time so it's not something that I'm not familiar with but yeah as I said on the other side people working well for you but it's not really for you but you you know you have the responsibility to tell them that hey how are you going with this task because we need to finish it by you know tomorrow noon or something like telling people what we have to do I feel really uh well I think it's hard (laughs) is it made harder by the fact that you are solely responsible for a particular area of the process oh definitely definitely yes like I I I could maybe just straight up say that I don't feel the the right to tell you know these other people working on other parts of that project what to do because they know better than me. I know that it's not about telling, you know, where to put which pixel. It's more about, it's really just management. It's more about timing. It's more about more about presentation. It's more about any kind of client uh, related stuff. So it's not telling them about their own job. But still, I just feel like, I, I think I don't feel yeah, I don't feel the right or I don't, I don't feel mature enough, if you know what I mean. For sure. And I guess you you would want the same thing for yourself as well. So you you wouldn't expect your colleagues to be sort of advising you which methods to be using for a particular thing. It works both ways, doesn't it? What do you think makes a good user researcher at the moment? What What are the things that make you as an individual someone that's valued by your team? Well, I'm a huge, huge advocate of soft skills. 
like I really do believe that you know the theory everyone can learn even from Google, <laughs> you can learn. But really, if you have, you know, just some kind of outline of what this whole process is about, you can learn the basics anywhere. But the part which I, which you can certainly develop, but I don't think that you can, you know, just learn from the books are just soft skills. It's very, <laughs> it's a buzzword. Everyone says empathy. So I really don't want to go into this one. Obviously, you have to be emp- empathetic. But then I also believe, which might uh, sound a, a little bit cocky, but I didn't mean it that way. But I do think that you have to have a, a very good vibe. You have to have charisma because you are interacting with people, usually like strangers, you know, foreign people who you don't know maybe you've met them for the very very first time you have to make them com- comfortable you have to make them trust you and believe that they're in a good place and they can yeah really like um trust you and trust you and uh, tell you know all their secrets well not secrets but sometimes it's about really confidential information you know like stuff that maybe they wouldn't just tell a stranger who is even probably recording it even though I promised and I'm not gonna put it out anywhere but still you know so I really do believe that you have to be able to pay attention to people and you have to be very vigilant at least during that time while you are with people I also believe that it helps a lot if you know a little bit about body language a little bit psychology you know so you you have to know people you have to you have to be able to realize when someone's uncomfortable and you know, there is this, uh, there are these numbers, I don't remember exactly, I just saw it yesterday, again, that uh, like some large, large percentage of our communication is through body language, but really large, it, it's like 70% or something. I don't know if you know these, uh, there are three numbers. One is like the things that you say, one is the tone of your voice. And the third, the largest proportion is body language. And you have to know it. You have to just, you know, recognize it right away if someone doesn't feel comfortable or if they get, you know, angry at something, but they don't say because they feel that, all right, I went into this interview, so I'm going to do it, but I'm pissed. You have to realize it. Yeah, I I mean, there seems to be another strand to that, which is becoming very uh, emergent in the UK, at least, around cognitive impairments Mm -hmm. within individuals and exploring all of these other diversity challenges that we're facing. We're we're just becoming more exploratory in in who we are and 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 how we behave but there there was also some statistics recently that something like uh one in four people that are born beyond 2000 the year 2000 will have some some form of cognitive impairment however that wants to be described whether that is is something like dyslexia and dyspraxia or adhd or at higher levels within the autistic spectrum and so those communication areas become a lot harder to define and to to get better with right because we're now faced with a situation where your body language doesn't necessarily reflect the way in which you're speaking and that creates an even harder thing to navigate so how in terms of research, what are the things that you can possibly suggest to people to look into or or things to explore to be able to improve working with people that are at times very different to the way that you are? Yes. Oh, well, I think um, I've always believed that if you want to know others, you have to know yourself and vice versa. So it for me personally, it's constant observation, you know, of myself and my surroundings, meaning 
people who, who are surrounding me and just constantly learning about them. You know, I think this is one thing that, that everyone should practice because it brings huge, huge, huge benefits, not only in your job, but definitely in your job, it's, it's a huge advantage. But in every part of your life, it's, it just makes it easier to navigate within this social construct <laughs> mm. that, that we call our society, which is so hard oftentimes. And I think that we are so impatient with each other. At least I experienced this, you know, living in a huge, huge city that people are just sometimes so rude to each other and so impatient and and we don't even pay attention to each other so we don't we judge right away and this is something that you absolutely have to learn as a researcher to you know just avoid ju any kind of judgment because it's it's not the place for it if it's something personal and if it's about your topic that you're researching then you you should just avoid it because <laughs> this is this is what research is about you have to be objective as much as you can and this is a very hard thing as well you have to practice it it's it's i think it's a, it's about practice all the time you have to know the basics like the theoretical basics of uh, every method but then you just have to practice it all the time that reason it's very good if you have you know another person next to you who can reflect on your methods on your performance anything right so being able to check in on on what you're doing because you're not you're not aware of it at the time yes yeah it's very interesting you know that i really do practice uh, a lot of like self awareness self observation introspection whatever you call it and yet it's it's totally different when you're, you know, live in action and doing the interview. You can't really focus that much on yourself because you are going to try to focus on the other person. If you don't, you're doing it wrong because you have to focus on the other person. Well, you're no longer present in the conversation, yes. are you? Yes, yes, exactly. And and this is a huge challenge for me that I'm trying to do both. You know, I'm trying to be hundred percent engaged with the with the other person, but also just leave a little bit of space uh, for myself to self reflect on my behavior, my yeah, my body language, for example. Because you know, sometimes you don't really enjoy these interviews, but the other person shouldn't see it. And body language, I think, is a thing that people, you know, they just feel it, even though. Maybe they, they've never heard of it. They never learned it. But it's a thing that we implicitly like feel because you know these facial expressions, you know these um, postures and everything, and you just feel mm. that the vibe is not that good anymore. Or maybe this conversation is a little bit boring for the other person, etc. So I really try to do my best and also focus on myself a little bit you know, just to control myself, not in a bad way, but in order to make the conversation go go smooth and not to ruin it with, you know, my own um, whatever. Maybe I have a conflict with myself because I had a bad day. But it, the other person just shouldn't see it. He should be absolutely comfortable. Thinking about yourself in the same way as that you're analyzing the person that you're with, if you're, you're looking to see whether they've checked out or whether they're being very res resistant to the conversation and realizing whether that's because you're projecting it against them. For example, yes, we talk about research and UX research in particular. It's a, it's a techie thing. Maybe people don't think too much into it, but for me, I really do think that we, just can't deny that these are, you know, social interactions with psychological background and social psychology plays a part in everything. So we, we just, we are human and we are trying to do it in a controlled environment, yet it has to be, you know, loose enough for 
comfort and for trust and and everything so i do think that it it you have to be paying a lot of attention into these little details. I was always a little bit skeptical about user experience design when you're looking at that very broad generalist approach that this introduction of psychology of various different fields was a little bit gimmicky and Mm -hmm. kind of unnecessary because at the time I was looking at it more in terms of interaction design. So I was I was looking at something and thinking there is no way that you can infer from whether someone pressed one button or another what they had for breakfast and what's going on for them today. But as we've been able to get deeper and deeper into and into conducting good research and interviews and and talking to people, that's where I feel this this whole area of of improving your understanding of cognition and psychology and sociology becomes really important. Yes. And I couldn't agree more because even though, or maybe exactly because of that, that I'm a cognitive scientist, I also felt that it's just, it's, yeah, it's too much. Like, why are we trying to prove that psychology plays such a huge part in Yes, interaction or UX design. And I I wouldn't necessarily say, even up to this day, that it does play a huge role, but I do think that it does in research. And not because of, you know, the the hard methodological stuff in that sense that it, it, it is never gonna be, you know, like an academic research. And all those people who are trying to do it that rigorously, I, I don't agree. It's it's never going to become one. It has to be much, much more custom to the special or unique needs of that specific project, of the, those specific clients, of those specific users you are speaking to. So I, I do think that it has to be much, much more flexible. Mm. But... I do think that soft skills and psychological knowledge in that sense is needed to do it right because you're interacting with people and you want to you know get information for them from them and we had some really uh <laughs> oh wow some really tight situations you know where I definitely felt like okay this is a very like hostile situation with this person because for whatever reason he said that he's going to do this interview but I from the moment I stepped in I could feel that he is that he's like straightforward aggressive about it and I had to handle this situation and if I wouldn't have you know any kind of knowledge about like higher knowledge about how to how people work, how to uh, behave with them in different situations and how to control a situation, like a social situation. If I wouldn't have known that, then probably I would have just, you know, cried or something because it was very, it was very, it was very hostile, I should just say. So was was that something where it becomes very clear that the individual has agreed to take part because something has happened and they feel like they want to be heard the client that you're working for whatever for whatever reason that message has not got across so they've they've used it as that opportunity to air their views rather than being a participant where you're driving it Mm. it was that they wanted you to know how they felt Actually, now that you're saying it might have been kind of a situation like that, I would have just said or I interpreted it myself as just he agreed to it because it was a... So we did interviews with um, B2B clients. So it was, you know, a B2B client and they were already existing clients and he just said yes for whatever reason. But he actually, maybe he just had a bad day, you know, and by the time I got there, (laughs) he didn't really feel like participating, um, I don't know, cheerfully. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to be cheerful about it, but you know, you just at least be neutral. 
maybe he just didn't like me. So w- for whatever reason, it was not that was not a good vibe. But now that you you said this, maybe he was after all pissed off about their business relationship or something because it really did feel like he he kind of wanted he 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 maybe thought that I am not an external you know participant in this whole ecosystem, but maybe I'm from that side of the business and he wanted to kind of push through a message I was not sure I didn't I didn't even really care I just you know realized that okay this is not cool (laughs) so I really have to it was very interesting I'm telling you it was like a it was very primal in a sense it was a dominance game it was very interesting it was very interesting that's such a difficult position to to find yourself in and there's there's been a lot of discussion within a few of the international research communities this year about safeguarding for researchers so how how do you ensure that you've got sufficient training for going out and doing things where you're potentially going into very complex or difficult environments particularly things like healthcare or the judicial system, which makes perfect sense. These are really complex things. We often forget that the most simplest of environments can be really complex for one individual. You have no idea what you're going to experience when you walk into it. When you were doing your studies, did you have any modules or elements of that that was kind of helping to support training about those kinds of situations? Oh, not really. Not really. Okay. No. So you're you're in the same boat as the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's really difficult. I think the other thing that I, I find really interesting with that, and that I'd I'd like to sort of hear your thoughts on, is what is the dividing line when you're in a, a situation like that, where someone that you're interviewing has clearly come in with an agenda, they have a thing that they're trying to to get off their chest, or their behaviour is acting in a way that you're not comfortable with. Is your responsibility to try and dig deeper into that to understand the root of that problem because it's instinctive? Or is it the fight or flight instinct of do you just close it down? Like, how do you make that decision within yourself as to whether to terminate an interview? Because that's a very difficult thing for anyone to do. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think I've done before what you said that I just let I just let them speak. And I was like, oh, all right. <laughs> I, I told it it's going to be a 40 minute interview. And then it was one and a half hours because they were speaking so much. And then I let it. Today, I wouldn't let it, I think because I I do believe that this is also our responsibility as researchers to keep it, you know, on track. It's it's not going to make you rude or something to, you know, just um, tell it in a very kind way that this is very interesting. I would love to talk about it for hours because I really do care. But unfortunately we have this interview to you know just get on with so we should get back to our initial questions you know it it doesn't make you rude I think we have this or at least maybe Hungarian people (laughs) I'm not sure (laughs) uh if if it's true for all the human beings but I definitely have or had this uh trait of just you know feeling that I have to listen I have to listen. I can't interrupt anyone because it's so rude, and I'm just there, you know. And they're making, they're making. Um, uh, well, how do you say it? You know, it's their time. They're giving me their time and attention, and they're helping me. And I, ha- I should be grateful. And if it takes two hours, then it takes two hours. But no, now I think that this is an interview. If they want, they can write me a letter afterwards <laughs> and tell all their problems but it really does not doesn't have anything to do with the topic we're discussing then I just wouldn't let it really and I've done it like just you know putting the conversation back on track 
and no one took it personally. No one thought that, you know, I'm rude or something because you can just tell it in a kind way. So being able to coach conversations back round to where where you need to sort of get to, allowing something to go as deep as possible before bringing it back. You, well, you have to be very, you know, again, you have to be very aware and analyze a conversation real time to be able to say that, okay, this is not part of the conversation anymore. This doesn't help us. This is going into a completely different direction. You have to be able to realize it and you have to be able able to make the call that this is super interesting, but we should get back to our original questions and topics. And maybe if we have time, we can discuss it in more depth, but not now. It's very much a rabbit hole, isn't it? When you start looking at... (laughs) If you were to do a retrospective on those kinds of interviews with those those very difficult uh, individuals, whether it's the ones that are closed and you can look at it and think, well, what questions could I have adapted to be able to get that to, to open back up? But then you can you can run the risk of going down that the the path the more academic path of creating a a, a conversational map right that's very linear that you can't get out of. It, like I always get worried whenever I work with people and I see them starting any piece of paper with number one and <laughs> you're doing like what are your twenty questions because it's like that's not I can't work like that. I, I know people that do, but what I find is that if you're doing user research in the way that we're all aspiring to is about conversations, right? Yeah. And you can't have a conversation where it's like you're tick boxing a thing. You you need to be a little bit more abstract in the question. And then you start to question your entire existence of should <laughs> I actually be doing this at all? Oh, absolutely. And I I Probably I even co- encourage people to do that because I always, you know, explain in the warm-up part or the introduction part how this whole conversation is going to be. And I always ensure them that they can talk about anything that comes uh, to their minds about this topic. I do have questions. I have this piece of paper. I'm going to look at it sometimes because... These are the topics that we have to go through. But besides or apart from that, this conversation can go to other parts as well or other other ways as well because maybe we didn't think of something that might be interesting for us as well. People, you know, they feel entitled that they can they can now talk about anything. And um, yeah, my colleagues, they always make a a uh, joke of me because they say that sometimes I'm like, uh, you know, like uh, a a person hosting a talk show or something. So it's just, it's just, I'm not being cocky, but it's just nice talking to me. And so there are people sometimes who just feel like, this is so amazing. Let's talk for another hour. <laughs> but isn't, isn't that what it should be about? Like, I, I always sort of think if you've... If you've got that structure where you've created a a discussion guide and you've got very like hard and fast questions rather than things that you just want to understand better, to me that's you've built a series of closed questions. You may as well put a survey out. Yeah. Because that's a better method, right, for, for putting that in. When is the method of user interviews the right method to use uh well i do quite i do have a quite a routine already in terms of research processes the methodology and user interviews for me are quite like the beginning not the very beginning of a project but you know within the first methods so for example surveys I do after I did interviews because I believe that surveys or at least this is the way I use them so far uh, but I believe that they are best for validating insights like quali- uh, qualitative insights quantitatively and also maybe just go into further details in the form of you know, close questions, 
but you already know the options that they can choose from because you did a lot of interviews. So you kind of have an overview on the topic and you kind of have assumptions and then you have to validate those on a bigger sample because, you know, qualitative research is never going to be representative. So this is why I do uh, surveys after interviews. So interviews first, and it's quite the first user interaction I have. So first I go, uh, well, those are also interviews, but not user interviews, but stakeholder interviews or stakeholder workshops, you know, just to uh, get everyone on the same page and get every background uh, information that we have to do. Maybe they already have some kind of uh, data about their users. So you can also analyze those. And then we already know what we are interested in or what we know more about, what we need to know to come up with a design strategy and like a plan. We collect all those questions and then make like a script out of it and we go and we do interviews. So it sounds like there's a bit of a, almost like that convergent, divergent, convergent thinking there of you're using the conversations to build up a really big landscape for you to explore. And then as you start to build those themes out, you can use methods like surveys and that that kind of tool to uh, rationalize the things that you've created with with large volumes absolutely and then there are you know usability testing which is also kind of an interview but a tricky a tricky one <laughs> but it's also an interview actually and then sometimes not so often but sometimes I also do focus groups which are also it's like a group interview uh, which can be done either at the beginning but so far I've always done it when we already had at least wireframes but more like prototypes so we were quite in the design process and then maybe we made some focus groups to get more insight what benefit do you get from focus groups well (laughs) i know that there is a huge huge debate around focus the use of focus groups and the benefits But personally, I don't see that it's so, so dangerous because I know that a lot of people, so the major pain about it, as far as I know, is that if someone uses it as a usability test, which you obviously shouldn't use it for, I didn't, I've never even thought that this would be an option, but we did use it to discuss, well, the concept of a product that we designed, you know, Mm -hmm. And the benefit, well, I love focus groups, but maybe just because they have a good vibe (laughs) and it's like, it's like a, it's like a workshop for me. So you moderate it and people are so cool and they're, they're so cute because they love. Now you said before that some people just want their voices heard. Mm. Now this is exactly what I felt in focus groups that there could be this atmosphere that people are just, they're so happy that they are within a group where they can just talk freely and they can discuss. And they're not even, some people might be, but in general, I didn't really experience that people would be, you know, ashamed of their opinion or afraid of conflict or arguments or something. And it always turned out so well. But yes, maybe um, mainly it was uh, discussing concept, the design concept, and also the topic that we were designing for in more depth and in more details. So by then we already know, already knew which parts of the design was, you know, the most critical ones. And then we brought it into a focus group and just let them pick it apart or just discuss it what problems they have with this idea yes it's always a like you say it's it's always a a a contentious subject of focus groups because of that loudest voice in the room challenge and sometimes I do wonder whether 
that is a problem when you have not been thorough with your selection process for the focus group. Like if you were doing market research and you just picked 20 random people off of the street, you should probably expect that there may well be some differing opinions and as a result, different people from different walks of life and therefore going to clash and some people are going to say nothing and some people are going to command the room and completely take over. But if you're doing something where you're curating that focus group because it's about you have a deep understanding of your persona then theoretically surely a focus group is literally like your persona template it yeah. should be a representation of like-minded individuals that match your persona I think the problem is because people create focus groups badly yeah oh well absolutely and also this lightest loudest voice in the room you said so uh, I don't know I think we can't just you know move uh, a method into the trash because we are not able to control a situation you have to be able like it never happened to me it happened that there were some people who told more but it, I, I like I had to control it and I had to make an atmosphere where we all felt that this is a friendly environment. It's fine to talk, but I just, it was so hard. I'm telling you, it was so difficult. We had, I think, like eight people. And I was lucky because they didn't arrive in the same time. So I had time, you know, to talk like one sentence with everyone who arrived, you know, signed the papers and every, everything. And I told them that even though, of course, it's it, if someone bothers, it could be anonymous. So I don't care what name they tell me, but just they should just choose a name for themselves, which they want me to call them by. And I learned their names. After five minutes, I called everyone by their names, you know. So these are, again, very important details, I think. And so I could say that, hey, listen, Adam or whoever, <laughs> this is amazing. Uh, you can finish this later. But maybe I would like to hear the opinion of whoever, Pete, because... I know that I paid attention. I was, you know, aware. I was present in the conversation and I paid attention. And I remember that he didn't say a thing in the past three minutes. And I do want to hear his voice. And he was not against it. Yeah. So it's, it's being, again, it's that being present, isn't it? And it's a, it's about being able to read a room and see what's yes, going on with those yes, people. You're a researcher. You, you took responsibility. You can't say that this is such a dangerous method because it's so, you know, it's so hazardous. There could be so many flaws. Well, of course, but what does it mean? It means that you have to put more work into it. That's a really nice way of looking at it. Doesn't It doesn't mean that you can't use it. It just means that you have to put much, much more work into it. And of course, you have to take every insight with a pinch of salt. But, you know... Sometimes it's the best you can do because it's eight person at the same time. You know, sometimes because of resources, it's the best you can do. Or maybe it's the really the best method to discuss that topic. And sometimes you do get great results. I want to ask you what the best piece of advice you've been given so far is. This is interesting again, but what I found the most comforting was that a fellow researcher just said in a lecture that we we have given um, with students studying to be UX researchers and we had a discussion about what these interview situations are like and uh, we were just talking about how, you know, humane these interactions are. It was so comforting for me to hear it from another researcher that she just said, you know, sometimes it happens that maybe you get sick or something while you're doing an interview, which is obviously super embarrassing, but we are made of human. And so if this is the situation, you absolutely have the right, you know, to say, I'm sorry, I need like five minutes or something. 
stop the interview and just, you know, stand up and go out if you need to, because we are human and we should never look at these situations like in such an uptight way that I have to be, it has to be perfect. We're not perfect. We are human. So as the interviewee and so are we researchers. So it was, mm. yeah, I, I, I really felt that, oh my God, I needed this because sometimes I just, you know, I get so anxious because maybe I'm not in the mood or, or maybe I, I am sick or something and it's fine. It's fine. I think that's a really lovely place to finish this up. And I, I hope that uh, some other people can hear that and reflect on it and think of the times where they've come in sick uh, or are just not with it at that point in time. Or maybe even, like you were saying before, they're halfway through and they realise they've checked out of this. Yes. There's something else going on and they need to they need to reset and, and allow yourself the opportunity to do that. Anna, it's been absolutely amazing speaking to you today. I really, really enjoyed it. If people wanted to uh, get in touch with you or, or learn a little bit more about what you're doing, where can they go? I do have an Instagram profile, like a professional Instagram profile. I'm not pro- proud of it because I uh, stabbed it in the past months, but they can absolutely find me there or my LinkedIn profile. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. There we go. Thank you once again for listening to another episode of the UX Coach Podcast. If you'd like to take part, if you'd like to share your story, maybe you'd like to follow up on a previous conversation, you can get in touch at the UXCoachPodcast.com. I'll be back in another two weeks with another conversation with someone from this incredible international community. See you then.